we only have politicians who hold forth, you know, loudly, you know, repeating themselves ad nauseum, right? Whereas, Professor Murthy is a, you know, a, an accomplished orator. And it's as though when he's speaking to a, you know, group of 100 people, it's as though he's speaking to you individually. You don't feel as though, you know, it's like the experience of cinema, in a cinema hall, the film only sees, you think, you know, because it's dark and it's you and the film. It's something like that, you know, his origin. So, for all these reasons, he is a very special person. For all these very private reasons, which are more precious than, to me sometimes, than the public reasons why he is, you know, better known and all that. So, I wanted to share this, uh, what is it? private knowledge with all of you <laughs> and so enjoy this uh, sessions. Enjoy Anupur. Have one mala interviews. I'll tell you why. Both of us have grown old. I am much older. She is still young in heart and she made me feel young in heart. <laughs> By what she said. I want to introduce to you the language of this state, Kannada language, and Kannada literature. <coughs> I tell you, I made a choice. I went to England for my PhD, worked on a great writer of the 1930s in England. Actually, found him out from his hiding. He was known in the 30s, but he disappeared from the scene, a man called Edward Upward. He went through a big uh, crisis in his life. He was a communist, and he was, became an active communist. Stopped writing because he thought that as a middle class man, he had no right to write about the masses who were passing through a great crisis then, because Hitler <laughs> was coming to power in Germany and there was fascism everywhere. And writers felt that they could not really speak the truth because the truth they knew was, after all, the truth of the middle classes and not of the lower classes. So he was a man who had gone through a big crisis. And I took him up and then I met him and I became friends with him and I saw his private letters and I enjoyed my PhD. And I enjoyed England. Enjoyed friendship in England. The Labour Party was in power. Harold Wilson, with his wife, you know, was a very dear figure, figure, a very articulate man. And there was a time when Nehru died in India, and I still remember seeing on this British screen Shastri coming to power, and Shastri was thrown playing badminton. A little man, very uh, badminton, and they always said whenever they spoke of Nehru. He went to school here in England. And I used to make, I mean, that used to make me feel angry. He was really schooled in India, but not in England. Yet, but one decision I took, even when I was there, was that I would not write in England, but I would write in my language, Kannada. What made me do this was the English language itself. The great lesson of the English language that it could produce a Shakespeare when England, when English was known only in England, not even in the upper classes. You know, the English upper classes still use the French. As in Russia, if you read a Russian novel <coughs> like Anna Karenina, you find that the husband and wife always speak French and they don't speak Russian. Because when they quarrel, they don't want the servants to know that they are quarreling. <laughs> so the French was a very helpful language for them to share their secrets. They spoke in French. And Russian was the language of the masses. So English was also <coughs> the language of the masses of the people who saw the play from sitting on the ground. Groundlings, they were called. But Shakespeare wrote 
not thinking of England as a little province, not on ethnic realities, you know, there's a word which I don't like, ethnic, anti-universal, you know, I said, you know, the ethnic is just of the place and the universal is something that applies everywhere. English was not used for ethnic purposes, but was used for universal purposes. Shakespeare examined, like the Greek dramatists, the fate of man, the fate of you know, whether God exists or not. All philosophical questions were taken up in Hamlet, in Lear, in Macbeth. But English was a language known perhaps only in London. And hence, the faith that came to me was that if English could be a language of the greatest of thoughts. Why not Kannada? Why not Tulu? Why not Konkani? Why not Tamil? Why not any language of the world? This is a conviction born in me when I was a student of England. With my love for English, you know, I, I still remember how before I went to England for my studies, I come from the village. The flower that I never knew of, but I admired, was daffodils because <laughs> I had read of it in Wordsworth's poem. And when I went to England, I was waiting for daffodils. And when the daffodils actually appeared, they were not really as beautiful as flowers in my own land. But daffodils was the flower of my mind. So one can love your language, love the literature of your language, and still be rooted in your own language. So I thought that the best thing to do as a creative writer is to be rooted in your language, but branch out into the world. Like uh, Shakespeare took themes from Roman history and any history and wrote great plays. So they were my examples. And also words from me. He lived in a small place called Lake District. You should visit Lake District when you are there, Lake District. And he made Lake District the world. Then I thought, if Wordsworth can make the Lake District the world, I have a poet in Karnataka called Dara Bendre, who has made Dharwad the center of the world. And for Bendre, all his imagery, you know, comes from, say, some 10 or 15 miles. But this is not ethnic. This is universal. <laughs> so one of the magics of literature is that it can make this kind of connection with the universal, the experience of the particular, of any place. Hence I thought I will teach English because I was an English teacher, but I will write only in my language, Kannada. So that is an introduction to myself and also to Kannada. I am not the first one to do that. Almost all the great writers in Kannada did this. The first great writer was a man called B.M. Shrikantaya whom I have not seen because I come from a village and he was in Mysore. But uh, he was the great Renaissance figure. He taught English, but translated English poetry into Kannada. And that created a revolution and many other poets came after him and uh, <coughs> used the new rhythms. Because I tell you something in uh, literature. In a literature, when the rhythm changes, thought also changes. Thought changes along with the rhythm. And that is an insight that even Plato had. Plato said, don't trust poets, they will change a civilization. By, they don't trust musicians, because they change a civilization by changing the tune. That was true when I was in England, the whole British civilization was changing. Because the Beatles were <coughs> the great poets. Who changed England? Beatles. And what did they change? They made it possible for England to listen to Sita. They opened up England to melody. With some tune. And where did they come from? They came from some narrow corner of England. Yes, you know, they were not in big cities. They were slum boys. And they did not become famous because of advertisement. They just became famous. 
a new tune. So that was true of all languages, of English also. Whenever there is a change in the rhythm of the language, there is a change in thought. After the French Revolution, England changes because there is a change in the rhythm of language. What was the change? In the 18th century, when they were sure of the world in which they lived, they were sure of the reason. Everything was reasonable to them. And everything worked reasonably, like a clock, so like a mechanical thing. So they had poetry which had perfect count. There were couplets where you can measure the lines and they worked according to the measure. But after the French Revolution, people thought nothing works according to the measure. Things unexpected happen. Unpredictable happens. And the rhythm of English also changed. With Wordsworth, Shelley, Keats, because that was heralding a new age of and only a very sensitive ear can see the change in the rhythm. And many times, you know, even today, I find children can pick up a new rhythm. In, in cinema songs, for instance, I find my, my grandchildren picked up uh, the new uh, rhythms from the great uh, Chennai music director, yeah. Yeah. Rama. Yeah. First, I, it was not I, my grandchild knew the rhythm. And it was changing the way they were thinking or they were acting. So literature also has this aspect. And in order to be effective, I thought, you should be effective, not in a foreign language. Because in a foreign language, the words have a meaning which the dictionary has given. And you have learned it. However, well you learned it. But in your own language, you have a rhythm and a way of saying things which no dictionary can fully define. And hence it catches experiences which are in the air. Not merely in the books, but in the air. So one has to be wedded to one's own language, which you have spoken from your childhood. Because it's one of the marvelous things, you know, the great linguists talk of how we learn a language. When a child begins to learn a language, it's a marvelous thing how they pick up words and also make sentences. A sentence is a very complex thing. There has to be a subject, object, verb to make sense. So the whole point, and hence, you know, the, the, the theory that this is inbuilt in us and it comes out. Also. All languages are the same basically and the basic structure. Anyhow, that's why when it comes to the question of language, there is nothing like a higher language and a lower language. There is nothing of that kind. Don't make the <coughs> distinction between the higher and the lower. Because Latin was much higher than English, but English produced much higher stuff than Latin. But nobody in Latin could write what Shakespeare was written writing in the 16th century. But languages have a fear. The fear is of coercion, of losing one's language. We have lost language. The Christian missionaries who went to America to make money in search of gold, not in search of God, but in search of gold, made the American Indians forget their language, forget their gods, forget their way of life, and took away their food. And today, much of the food that we eat is what we took from the American Indians. Corn and so on. And they lost their language. But fortunately, India did not lose any language until now. And these languages have survived. Number one, I want to tell you, because wherever you are, in whatever part of the world you are, you partake of the life of whatever is in the air, only if you know the language of that area. 
whether it is your mother tongue or not. If I am in France, I should know French. If I am in Karnataka, I should know Kannada. If I am in Tamil Nadu, I should know the Tamil. So there is no question of linguistic narrow-mindedness in this. It is just to be able to live as fully as possible in whatever area you live. So if I decide to live in Karnataka, I expect I will live right in Karnataka. I have no regrets about it. No regrets at all because people ask, you know, people ask, uh, it's geographically a very limited area, what will you gain? I would say Shakespeare wrote in a very limited area when he wrote. Not many people could speak. Homer too, not many people could speak. But they became world writers. And Canada has some world writers. And it is not said in pride only, but it is said with some kind of critical discrimination because Kannada has this genius of not being just an ethnic language, not being just concerned with ourselves, but concerned with the affairs of the whole world. How did it all begin? You know, for us, the language exists even before writing, but a literature exists after it becomes written. But the language itself when it exists can have oral literature. <coughs> we have great oral literature, like even tribal languages have great oral literature, very great oral literature. And a tribal language can produce a Homer because a Homer was produced in a tribal language when it was a tribal language. So there is no bar. But a tribal language may not be able to produce a Bertrand Russell. <coughs> because a Bertrand Russell and his philosophy requires a language being used for discourse for a long time. The language of discourse has progress. The language of illumination has no progress. It comes and goes. It can come and go anytime. Like the Vedic sage got the highest of truth at a time when our life was barbarous. But the highest of truth was revealed. All over the world, it revealed itself to Muhammad, it revealed itself to Christ, it revealed itself to Gautam Buddha, it revealed itself to the Vedic sages, it can reveal itself to the American Indians. You know, one of them, you know, wrote that very famous thing when he was asked to sell his land. He writes to the white man, you believe in buying land, buying water, buying air, your civilization will not last long. That's what? A, an American Indian, you know, it's a very famous statement which is used. I don't remember the exact words of the statement. So, truth can get illumined at any time in any language. But discourse needs development <coughs> of thought, of history. There should be gone, there should be this, 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 this for this philosophy to come. So we make, you have to make, make a distinction of the two. And hence, Canada has grown not in the sense of its illuminations, which are there in Pampa, in Kanaka, in Kumarasa, in Kuambu today, in me, in another writer, it can come and go. But rational thought, which has to be used for sociality, history, science, when you have to talk about modern things, <coughs> needs to be. Now when a language feels that it has the one and not the other, in a world which is very competitive, where without the other you can't exist at all, I mean the discourse, where you can't exist at all, then the language is crisis. Canada is in a crisis of that kind. But equipped to develop both. <coughs> you understand me? It is equipped to develop 
insights at any time of history because it has shown there are such insights all through our thousand years of Canada history. But it has a capacity to develop the other that it even grows begins nearly a thousand years ago. What is the age of the X, you know, in the data text that I have? The prose text in Canada. What data? What data? What is the century? About uh, 10, 11? 11, 11. 11. So, Canada has shown that we have developed prose also. Prose text, you know, a, a great language of being. Tribal people can have poetry, but not prose. Prose wants discourse. It takes time. But Canada showed that it has prose. And we all speak in prose without knowing that we are speaking in prose. Anyhow, the spoken language has prose. But the written language can have that kind of prose of discourse takes time. Now, it begins with one word, that is what I want to say, and I am told by a great actor, uh, what is this writing? Okay. Yeah, a great writer called him. Sort of uh, Sanskrit. He was uh, in Chicago and in Washington. He's in very great fame now because he has written a book on what I am talking about now. Shankar Pollock. On the language of Cosmopolis, on the language of a particular area. He shows how there is a big revolution without our knowing in the world, in Europe as well as Asia. What was that revolution? In Europe, the language known all over Europe was Latin. When Newton, the great scientist, had to share his ideas, he used Latin. Because somebody in Germany or in Italy or somewhere else who is also a scientist would know what is happening only if you write in Latin. That's what Newton did. But when Darwin came, Darwin was the first great scientist to write in English. English should be known only in England. But Darwin wrote his origin of thesis, origin of species, in English. It had its own effect on English writers. You know, people like Tennyson and others who came, who felt that they all came from God, had to contend with the fact that we all came from monkeys. <laughs> that there is a, a slow evolution. That's why the religious Americans, even now, want an alternative text to be taught along with origin of species. What is the alternative text? Bible. <laughs> Another theory about the development of life. Can you know, this was a revolutionary book. Newton's book is not revolutionary. You know, it, makes you change your perception of the material world in scientific terms. But Darwin makes it possible for you to change your whole view philosophy of life. And that was written in a, the language of the people, the mass language. Newton used Latin. This was so all over the world. In India, Shankara 
I can imagine Shankaracharya in Kerala and with his mother. If he wanted something, if the mother wanted something, she would use Malayalam. And most palpably Shankara, when he walked over Kerala, if he was born in Kerala, spoke Malayalam. But when once he got out of Kerala, he had to use another language, and that was Sanskrit. That was true of Ramanujan. He was inspired by the Tamil saint poets, Arvas. Ramanujan, the basis of Ramanujan's bhakti is in Arvas. But he got his Vedanta from Sanskrit Vedic texts and he used Sanskrit. So he is a Tamil man using Sanskrit because the language of Cosmopolis was Sanskrit as the language of cosmopolis in Europe was Latin. Milton, who came, comes after Shakespeare, <coughs> wants to plead that we should all write in the regional languages. Because English was also a regional language. No. And in order to plead that, do you know in what language does he write? He wrote it in Latin. And Dante, decides to write in Italian. Why we should write in Kannada? In Kannada! That's why this book is unique in the history of the world. And also in Tamil, there is a book, you know, on Tamil grammar, in Tamil. This may be a little more ancient than Kannada, I don't know. I don't know. Enter into the theory of it. There is some and this book came, which is a defense of why we should write in Kannada, is in Kannada. Whereas Dante's defense of why you should write in Italian is in Latin. And Milton's too is in Latin. And Milton also was also a, a great man who fought for liberty, for freedom, for, uh, you know, he was a Puritan and he was against the ritualism of Christianity. And he wrote such pamphlets in letters because he wanted to make an appeal to the whole of Europe. That is true in India too. Gandhi had to write in English and also in Gujarati. Tagore had to write in Bengali and also in, uh, in English. And um, Nehru wrote in English. Thanks to Nehru, our grandchildren speak to us in English. That's what Charan Singh said, <laughs> who was a backward looking man. <laughs> this is very strange. In India, we have very strange things of this kind. And they are all true also. You know. But Nehru himself tried hard to speak in Hindi, and now Sonia speaks in Hindi. <laughs> she has to speak in Hindi. And so we. India is the one country where it is not enough if you know the language of Cosmopolis. You have to know the language of the region. And people think it is a problem. I want to tell them it's not a problem. It may be a gift of God. So it's something, you know, unique. And they have to deal with it, you know. And, and evolve slowly. A language which uh, can mediate between languages. Hindi must grow like that, you know, a language which mediates between languages. I don't know if that will happen. But anyhow, India is a big experiment. Now I'll come back to this book. It was written in the 10th oh, century, a little more earlier. It is, so the book's name is Kaviraj Mahal. There may be a Sheldon Pollock's translator of it. I was a colleague of Sheldon Pollock in Iowa when we were to talk about, when we began talking about this, and then we got interested in this book and he has done marvelous work on this. Kaviraj Marka, look at the title. I have a dear friend who is now no more, a very great name in Karnataka, a man called K.V. Subbana. And while you are here as students, I would advise you, 
at least one year you should go to a place called Hegodu, which is in Neenasam. There is an organization called Neenasam. There is a drama school there. It's in a village. There is a village theatre. And um, this, is, this is the genius of Canada. In our village theatre, they may have a Shakespeare play in translation, a Sanskrit play in translation, and a local play. So the local and the universal are mixed in everything that we do in India. You know, we have the whole range. That's why, you know, we have not become ethnic. I don't like that word. <laughs> I don't like that word. It's, you know, it's a very fashionable word. I don't like it. Nothing is ethnic. Everything is universal. Anyhow, you should go there. You know, there is a... You know, every year there are some great days of camp there so in the village. Which again, you know, the world meets there. That's my theme today, you know, how the world comes into Canada and Canada into the world. And Kavi Rajamarka is the first book which defines this. Defines a language you know, we, whenever we talked about language, Sanskrit, we called it language of the gods. Deva Bhasha. Of the gods. Not the of man. Subsequently of man, but otherwise language of the gods. Whereas, our writer of Kaviraj There are two names for him, you know. One is uh, the king's name, the hero, what is the name of the king? Drupatunga. And the other is Sri Vijaya. Drupatunga was the king. And the poet in his place is Sri Actually, it is Sri Vijaya who wrote it. Drupatunga was the king. And the name is Kavi Raja Marka. And my friend Kavi Subarna, about whom I spoke, you know, who started this Ninasam in the Guru, has a very fine comment on that. It is the highway Marka of the king of poets. What is the, the best of the poets? What kind of language does he use? And the other interpretation is what is Kavi's marka, what is Raja's marka? Is there a way for the poet and a way for the king? Now it is very easily said that the king's way can't be the poet's way. The king has to build, has to police his state, has to live through, has to, you know, the great uh, Political commentators said, I think uh, even our own great political <coughs> commentator, what is his name, you know, who made Chandrahasa the king? Chanakya. He said, if you can't live, if you can't rule without love, you have to rule with love. If you can't rule with love, you should at least rule with fear. Now, that is the basic text of a political text. Try to rule with love. If you can't, then rule with fear. Let people be afraid not to do certain things. Love and fear together would be the idea. That never happens. Anyhow, is there a marker which is common for the Kavi as well as for the Raja? In other words, here is a text which tries to ask the question, can you have a poetics which is also politics? 
We think that the poetics and politics are two different things. The materialist community tries to show they are not two different things. For instance, you know, there are great <coughs> statements there that the golden value is to tolerate every religion. And he takes an example of that to give an example of a certain kind of poetic flavor. So he makes use of great political statements and uses them metaphorically to describe how a sentence works in a poem. So he is making a political comment along with poetic analysis. It's a very strange text. And so Sheldon Pollock says that there is no text of that kind in the world. So you become and also it's unique because I forgot that point, you know, I began with that. Sanskrit is considered the Deva Bhasha, the language for anyone, everyone, anywhere in the world. They say that it is the fittest language for computer now. You know, that's the claim of the uh, Sanskrit uh, Panini grammar. You know, Panini grammar, a bit of which I learned when I was a little boy. I still remember you have to learn by heart certain words like that without knowing what it meant. And I said, you know, you have got the key and you get, it's almost like having a computer before you and you get the entire grammar. They say Panini is one of the greatest grammarians of the world. But it's not a language spoken by people in any area. Our poet Kaviraj Marga, poet, says, the writer says, he defines language geographically. That's the first definition of language in geographical terms, in a book. Kannada is a language spoken from Kaveri to Godavari. And he does it so well. He doesn't say the entire Godavari, up to Godavari, and you can have a political quarrel over which is up to. <laughs> you know, all border disputes are up to. <laughs> up to means what exactly is the dividing line. But from Kaveri, we are sure, to up to Godavari, up to. And then it receives, and then it also with some emperor, it may go further, go back, you know, that can happen with the Vistarana of an empire. So he defines language in terms of geographical terms. So he accepts that the language is not universal. Sanskrit, the claim of Sanskrit is that it is universal, they are. But the claim of Canada is not universal. It is geographically limited, bound. Limited is the wrong word. Because he says that what can the language do? The language, he says, is in the world. And the world is in the language. If you get the text in English, you can read the text, you know, and only taking bits of it. The language is in the world. The world is in the language. The entire world is in the language. We have also the same great metaphor of the mirror and the lamb in our poetics. A literary text is a mirror that you can see yourself delineated in the mirror with all the Subtleties of your face and everything, you know, mirror. The mirror to know what you are, who you are. The Ramana always said, when somebody went to him, what is the only question? Who am I? Ask who am I. So it says that a literary text is a mirror. Not merely a mirror, but a lamp. You can use the literary text to search for other things, like that. It's both mirror and what is the Kannada line, Asha? Mati Darpan. 
But this great poet wanted one Kannada to prevail over other Kannadas. Did he want all the other Kannadas to be destroyed? No. No, he didn't. He didn't mean it. Nor can they be destroyed. Do you know what happens to every language? It has happened to English also. If this language of this particular area enjoys a premier status now, after a few years, another dialect of the same language may get empowered. See what has happened. One kind of American English is empowered in Hemingway, the other in the North American writer, the great North American writer, in him. Stay in Yes, all of them. Any North American writer, you know. You know, a different kind of English. Faulkner. If you read Faulkner's uh, stories, you see that there is another English. And English is a lucky language because it's a very hospitable language. There can be African English. There can be West Indian English. There can be Indian English. Okay. But our poet, like all great uh, critics, wanted one kind of Canada to prevail over. Like all Oxford, Cambridge people who want their Canada to, their English to prevail over the other Englishes. In England also there is a fashion, you know. I had a professor, Richard Hagrid, who came from the working class. The working class English was completely different. Very different from the gentleman English. When I was there, there was a big debate between you and non you have you heard about you and non you? You is upper class. Non you is lower class. And you can know you, non you in my Canada by finding out whether you say sa, sha, sha. Whether you say ha, a. In English, you can find out with many ways. If I ask for tea, you give me tea with sugar, you are non you. If you bring me tea decoction, milk separate, sugar separate, please have tea, then you are you. Also, if you have pounds tea, if you are non you, lower class you say, I have dentures. But if you says, I have false teeth. <laughs> he is more, you know, uh, ready to accept reality. Yeah, you will say, danger. So they made a view, non you category. That means in, in language, in the use of language, everywhere, there will be several languages. But in literature, there is always an attempt to make one kind of language prevail over another. Do you know who has given? Now we are Karnataka. Karnataka got one language from Bellari to Bijapur to Gulbarga to Mysore to Mandya everywhere. You know who gave it? Not a poet, Rajkumar. I have written something on that. I was a great actor. He spoke artificially. Artificial in quotation marks. It was not, it was a bookish kind of a Kannada. But he never made it seem artificial didn't sound artificial. And it became Sri Vijaya's great dream of having one Kannada was fulfilled when Rajkumar spoke like that. I am telling you something about Kannada. You know, these are metaphors. It is an ancient language and it is a modern language. It had problems as an ancient language. It has problems as a modern language. It has a continuous kind of a history. And what is the other? The philosophical thing. In all, for all our moral purposes, you go to philosophy. Then, even today, you know, if some Indian is very pretentious and he makes a speech, he would be considered a great pundit only if he quotes from Sanskrit. There was a time when every speech had to have two or three Sanskrit quotations. 
and Canada made it unnecessary to quote from Sanskrit because our Vachanakaras said everything in Canada. Whatever could be quoted in Sanskrit are already there in the Vachanas and in Sarvatna, you know, another poet. So, uh, and in our own time, Mankuti Manakaka, D.V. You know, the, for every politician in Karnataka, if he has no words to speak and if he fumbles, he can get something from Mankuti Manakaka and then get over it. Now, I would like to give to all the jailed people a copy of Mankuti Manakaka. <laughs> they will come out wiser than Bhartya. <coughs> Anyhow, we have such different <coughs> things. And all those were foreseen by this man who wrote a thousand years ago, this Kadirai. And hence, you know, Canada is a language which has been classical literature, which has birthday literature, which has very modern literature. Poetry, theatre, cinema, and luckily we have a constitution which doesn't have a central government, the world central government is not. We should call it the union government. The Indian structure of the two things, one is the secular, and uh, what the world for it is. Each state has its own great competitor in the South Asian country. Everything was it's a great government in the country. In the Federalist country. Why? Because of history. And we also got linguistic states. And all the intellectuals of those linguistic states. They thought India would be torn to pieces. Whereas Gandhi, Tagore, in the past wanted linguistic states. Nehru didn't want it because there was through science. People who are intelligent <coughs> on science and technology are a little worried about two independence. Because it comes in the way of marketing. <laughs> and then put it in the market. And he said, there will come a time when people want fitted shirts. I live for that time. <laughs> so when marketing is destroyed, he will go to the tailor to get your shirt made. He will go to your country. So do with the language. People are now worried about too many languages because it comes in the way of marketing. So the market gurus will have to find Another way of marketing, so that the language is not a, an impediment <coughs> and can be. But if you want the kind of plurality that we have, you need all these languages because it is said that when a language dies, a whole civilization dies. There's only one country where languages have died in my own time. England. There was one language in Cornish. The last speaker died. And you can't have a language with only one man. You have to have somebody to speak to. He at least spoke to God, I think. He didn't like that. And when he died, God also forgot that language. 
There is a joke about Pakistan, you know. Finish it with that. Pakistan also has many languages, but they have not faced it the same way we have faced. Once I asked Chintiza Hussain, a great writer from Pakistan, give me a book of stories from Pakistan in Sindhi, in Punjabi, in Urdu, and there are several other languages, huh? Balochistan, so many languages. There must be writers in all those languages. He said, it's a very difficult task. I said, get them, translate them into Urdu, and we will publish it from Sahit Academy. In Sahit Academy, my members told me, if they write anti-India and you publish it, you will be in trouble. I said, I believe in a writer. He can't be either anti-India or anti-Pakistan. Writers are different. I will publish it. And, he, and there was a problem. I couldn't give them money because there was no monetary transaction between India and Pakistan there. Then I said, don't worry about that. Then they said to me, send us 20 copies. That's enough. It's an honor for us to publish in India. I published it. And Intizar was there last time when I met him, told me, when Pakistan also changed and there was a civilian government, they wanted to know that there are many other languages and they made this a textbook in Pakistan. I, I tell you this because the plurality of languages is really a fortune. In the day, don't think so. That's why Pakistan broke into Bangladesh and Pakistan. Because they didn't think of the plurality as a blessing, but they thought of it as a curse. And that country could not be kept together. India is kept together until we think of it as a blessing. And we continue to do and I'm sure that this course, our teachers, will give you some translations. There are very good translations in Hindi and in several languages and in English also. One more, I'm sure, will give you some basic texts of translation for you to read and come. Today you should have come reading that book, but it doesn't matter because I have given you a kind of a, a brief account of it. You can ask me questions on the place. Answer your questions. But you will get, I think, the text also. <coughs> give them a text if there is Sheldon Pollock's text, you can give it to you. Our Subhanas book on this has been done into English. Yeah, we have distributed yes. some of the copies. Thank you. Now, and I just want to understand what is that fear that senses this kind of threat. And for all India, now you know Europeans feel that there is a threat to their languages, English. For instance, the European cinema, great cinema, but the American cinema is still more popular, and um, their own cinema doesn't have the same kind of an audience. And in, in uh, Korea, when I went to Korea, I found the Koreans translate a lot from American into Korean. Particularly these romances, you know, these books that you buy in the airport, big, very light weight books that you can read and throw. They get translated into Korean quickly, within a week. And people buy only those texts. So translation has become a curse. In, in, uh, in Korea. And also, you know, like that. So, it is possible that our children, in order to be successful in life, now, the parents will find a medicine where even the child in the womb gets the American accent. I mean, when it can go up to that level, that kind of mindless but by the time they do it, they may have to learn Chinese. <laughs> and it's better to have our language and any other language. Okay. Why is it that the Indian languages have not developed <coughs> technical sort of language for like higher studies, you know, like engineering, medicine and stuff like that? No, they have not used. 
Now we will we will go to Ayurveda. It has all been active. If you go to mathematics, you know, don't we don't use it. But my father taught me mathematics. He was a student of mathematics. When he went to high school, because he had some learning in Sanskrit, in Sanskrit, and it is such a tremendous language. I will give you an example because you asked me because this, there is so much of ignorance. You know, my teachers always taught us how if there is a, if, you, if there is a square or a triangle within a circle, how to find the area of the triangle or the circle. So in Sanskrit, my father had taught me. So if, if, if you can be remember, remember it because they are all verses. Bhuja samasa dalami chatustitam. Nija Buddhai, Prakrata, Kutam Munikam. Ata Parapaspara Meva, Samayi. Kriti Padam, Tri Chatur Pujan. Bhuja Samasa. Take all the sides, add them. Dara. Make it half. Put it four ways. Chatustitam. Nija Buddhai, Kramasha, Kutam Munikam. Take every side and then minus it. Yeah, but it was written over to minus it, minus it, minus it, minus it. Ataparaparame, Samayata. You do, do you, you multiply one with the other. Kriti Padam, find the square root. Three Chatur Puri or Padam. This is centuries old. And this is true even today. They work like that. <coughs> it was never, it is there. And it is there in verse. Nobody can write a better textbook than that. So we didn't use any of our language. One. Second, I am not too eager to have a word which is not uh, universal. Now I don't mind using all the English words because they are not English words. They are all Latin. Even England had to borrow from Latin resources. Why did they borrow from Latin? My professor used to say, you can never say atom bomb. You have to say nuclear fission now which is more Latin, because atom bomb is emotional. Nuclear fission is psychic. You know, you always have recourse to a foreign language when you want to make it a calculated kind of thing and not emotional. Not atom bomb, but nuclear fission. Okay? Like that. So we can take all those words. And Canada has a great uh, ability. I, I, I said it many times. Canada has a kombu. You know, Kombo is the horn of a, and the bull is very proud of its horn. We are very proud of Kombo because if you put a who mark, it becomes a Kannada. Table, table, no. <laughs> the who mark is also like this. Who is like this? Man, manu, woman, no. You can just make any word into You know, the every language have this ability to make tabh. You know, our words also are derived from some other language. And I tell the Bengalis, if you speak in Sanskrit with a bad pronunciation, it becomes Bengali. <laughs> it is so deeply Sanskrit. So languages have that uh, I didn't tell you what Ali has said. Further, he said in England, for the working class children, they speak a kind of pidgin English. And so when they come to school, if you begin to talk to them in real, proper English, they don't learn. So it's better to teach them in their own pidgin for a while and then slowly bring them into the proper English. Because, and my friends who went to the Jerukurvas to teach, you know, there's a man called Narayan, who has done a lot of experiment in Jain Kurva tribes. Their children can be taught properly only if you use the Jain Kurva dialect. And then you know they begin to learn quickly. But sadly, do you know what we are doing with the Jain Kurvas? Our teachers go and give them different names. What the good the, you know, this kind of name they have. Krishna. Ramachandra, and they don't know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> so you tell
take away their language, you take away their names, you take away their gods, and then you want them to learn, they won't. They should learn with everything, you know, intact. Have I answered your question? Yes. I do not know how much truth is there in this statement, but I read an article by Ajaz Ahmed on Indian literature, which said that uh, most of the European languages are not uh, do not face that much uh, threat because the uh, institutes that can translate uh, literatures from one place to another are are like a lot of them are available. But in Indian languages, I I guess he said that uh, the variance is that great that it's not possible and, and there's no comprehensive or a cohesive or, a, or one institution that you know can really translate literature so you do not have an access to a small amount of literatures which are produced in different parts of the countries. So is that because That's of... True. Ayraz is a very, very fine, very profound writer himself. And he has his own way of translating, you know, he's to translate <coughs> And also, you know, there are many other problems, you know, quite a few languages in the north, Punjabi, and also the language of Jammu and Kashmir, they are not very different. They are very close to each other, different only in, in some words. And that has remained so because they didn't have a Sri Vijaya. <coughs> if they had a Sri Vijaya, he would have correct, made it possible for all of them to be one language with slight variations. <coughs> now in Kannada, a Dalit writer like Mahadeva writes in the Kamara dialect, which is hard for me to understand. So many people told him, you have to be translated into Kannada. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That may happen. And in, you know, Shivram Karan wrote this Chumanduri. There is something you should know about Chumanduri. The entire play and the entire novel takes place in the language Tul. So when you are reading them in, in, in Kannada, they are all talking to each other in Tulu. So Shivram Karanth is translating them into Kannada. It was translated into Tulu. That means you know, it came back to its own land. This is another feature of Kannada, I should tell you. We have a large number of Konkanis and Konkani writers. Konkani script is not there, but they speak Konkani at home. They write in Kannada, and all the characters in that Kannada novel may be speaking Konkani, but they are speaking in Kannada. So in a way, some continuous translation is taking place. Marathi in Kannada, Tamilians in Kannada characters. Whereas in a lot of English novels, Jane Austen to Dickens, not up to Dickens, but a little earlier, they were all English people. <coughs> the characters also spoke English. Several kinds of English, though. Only with Graham Green, you find Vietnamese and everyone is in the novel. The whole scene changes with Americans and also later on with uh, the British, like this. Whereas the Kannada writers have to deal with Tulu, Bari, and other language speakers within their novels. And hence our early novels sometimes had some conversation in other languages. So another language is also used in this text. It happens in Kalidas and Shakuntala. They say there are four languages in Japan. Particularly when women speak this language. They speak the local dialect sense of not the I like your point about the ethnicity, the ethnic thing. I remember going to a music shop in uh, The Hague and uh, I saw Maharajpuram, uh, Santanam and Beethoven. Beethoven was in the classical section and Maharajpuram was in the ethnic <laughs> <laughs> section. But uh, the point that I wish to uh, reflect on 
is that this ethnicization, the search for diversity, authenticity in terms of local voices, is itself in part driven by the logic of commodification. And to that extent, I sometimes wonder whether we may have found a language but lost our voice. So, just, uh, you know, when you think of Indians writing in English, maybe there is a real authentic experience being shared there. But it could be that uh, both forms can lead to posturing and loss of authenticity. Is it Indian knowledge in English? If we conscious of who we writing for others, a lot of explanation stuff can get into it. We buy, right, say in Canada, we are grabbing him, sat down, we go to the to eat. I will not write exactly, you know, how we did questions and everything. You know, we will start eating. But in an English novel, you will take some time to start eating because you will have to do your writing. So you hunger it, sir. I'm saying it jokingly. But that can happen with all of us whether you use this, this language or that language. Raja Rao was very authentic to me. Absolutely. If you read his Kantapura, I would say one of the greatest novels on Gandhian struggle came from Raja Rao. And it is exactly like a Kannada novel. Even the sentences. He writes in a famous phrase, when my people tell me a story, there is no full stop, there is no comma in our language. It goes on and on and on. <laughs> Whereas in English there are commas and full stops and semicolons. Whereas then but however. How do I avoid it? So he tried to avoid it and then he wrote a different kind of an English article. And it is possible in English. Because English is a very hospitable language. Because it became imperialist. It had to take the experience of every other country. And so, willy-nilly, it develops into a certain kind of a, a great broadness. Okay. I don't know whether French is as malleable as English, so far as experience of other countries are concerned. I don't know, because I find it, but English is. And now, that kind of a hospitable language I find is Malayalam. Among the very hospitable <coughs> translation and Hindi is becoming also hospitable. <coughs> Taking experiences of other lands. Otherwise, as you said, we will put Beethoven in one section. <laughs>
When I am not in this station,